Yo, this is Jumping Jack Frost, and welcome to the Frost Report. Boom! Boom. Everyone, welcome to the Frost Report, where every month I'm joined by different guests to talk about a wide range of subjects from music, social issues, and just like loads of things, anything that could be that needs to be spoken about at the time. Yeah. So last summer we saw the death of George Floyd, the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, and an increase in racial tension that hasn't been seen for years. So, you know, here we are at the Frost Report, and it's time to have that uncomfortable conversation. Yeah. So, introducing my guests, first of all, Funk Butcher, DJ, producer, and recently um, appointed at PRS for Grants and Programs Manager for Industry Funds, yeah? we got Spencer Fearer and the Knowledge, ex-professional boxer, TV pundit, bo- ex- um, boxing promoter, and just an all-round boxing historian. Kevin Campbell, ex-Arsenal, Everton, Nottingham Forest, and Trosbor footballer, striker, scored many, many goals, does the boom, bye, 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 the ball go on the football pitch, and is my bedroom for a long time. Paul McKenzie, a youth activist, podcaster, and filmmaker. Do you know what I mean? I do a lot of work with him as well. Welcome to the guy, welcome to the show, guys. Um, welcome to the Frost Report. Great to have you all here, man. How are you guys doing? Good, man. I can, I can hear you all. So, oh, um, first question I've got, right, we're going to go straight into it. The first question um, is for everyone, I'd like everyone to, um, to answer this. I'm going to start with you, Butch, yeah? Fuck Butcher, what would you explain the concept, how would, no, sorry, how would you explain the concepts of Black Lives Matter to a child? And why do you think it is necessary that they know? Um, I think it's important for all children to kind of understand from a very early age that <clears throat> the world that they come into, even though from a nursery setting at the earliest point, it's kind of educated to young children that everyone's on a, an equal level footing and level playing field and so on and so forth. But the reality is, is very different once they get into the adult world. And the moment you can begin to kind of influence those subtle nuances as, as to how the real world outside of school, outside of the protective settings of schools and nurseries, how it treats people of different colours, different ages, different genders, sexualities, and so on and so forth, then you can begin to begin, sorry, you can begin to build up an emotional awareness yeah. from a very early point. So I think what's happened over a period of time is that there's been a lack of education. So what happens is that um, the, the, the largest racial contingent in this country, white people, they go through the majority of their life believing that there is no problem, there is no issue, and you just live in a meritocracy. You can work your way out of every situation. It's the capitalist model, isn't it? But the reality is, is that the way the system is set up, the it it doesn't ref, it doesn't respond the same exactly. way it does for everyone within this this environment. Exactly. So exactly. The earlier kids can have an understanding that okay, there is a level of unfairness attached to certain groups, then they can put in and help from their space of privilege when they get into those spaces as they get older. So I think it's very important for parents of all ages, races, generations to begin to start those conversations and not feel like, well, because I'm not of that race, it doesn't affect me because the chances are you're going to work with someone of that race or you're going to do business with someone of that race and you have to understand. Yeah, that's that's well answered. Do you know what I mean? The same question, Paul McKenzie, First of all, explaining that concept, you have to have a childlike mind to even start unraveling the complexity of what Black Lives Matter mean. I would teach, I would teach, and I always do teach young people that all lives matter. Some lives are just more complicated and face things like racism, etc. So I teach children that all lives matter because you know, and I've spoken openly about this whole Black Lives Matter quotes. And 
the way I agree with it and the way that I think that it could be done better. Because uh, I think we're at a time now where if you look at the average young person or that peer group, they're mixed anyway. A lot of children, are literally, they have friends from, my son's got friends from Greece, uh, Africa, Somalia, they're, they're all over the world, white friends. So I teach my children that all lives matter, but some lives are more challenging. And that, uh, as we said before, that marginalization of specific races is where we have to put that focus. So all lives matter because we have to respect everything. You know, we can't, we can't, we can't teach children that, okay, because you're black means you're automatically limited. You've got, you know, and then that installs limiting beliefs in them. I teach them that all lives matter, just that some lives are going to be more challenging and you have to explore exactly what those challenges are. Yeah, I like that. It's a good answer. Great. And you know what? Um, I'm just going to add something there because the thing with all lives matter, and I'm sure we've all had this where we have people saying, but surely all lives matter. Do you know what I mean? But um, well, I, I, I've, got a, I've got a thing what I say, what I got from somewhere, where I say, listen, I know all lives matter, but right now your house, house ain't on fire. Black people's house is on fire. We need protecting from the police and and from ourselves in some cases, you know what I mean? So, yeah, I take that. Love, thanks, thanks for that question, um, for that answer, Paul. That's a yeah. really good answer. So, Spencer, how would you explain the concept of Black Lives Matter to a child, and why is it necessary that they know? Um, you know what? I'm gonna be one hundred, and you know, I'm I'm being a burning fire for the longest time. Yep, I so, know. That's why you're here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but you know what? I've kind of retired from burning this fire now. You know what I mean? Uh, seriously, because to me, it's more of the case of, uh, I think Johnny Nelson put it really, really well. He said, Black Lives Matter as well. Because as soon as you start talking about Black Lives Matter, and let me explain to my children, I've got four beautiful kids. So for me to explain to my children that Black Lives Matter, I don't. I explain to my children that you you matter. You know what I mean? My children happen to be black. You know what I mean? My wife happens to be black. So I'm teaching my children that that you matter and you're important. So for me to then take it out of the context of black, we go down this road of explaining to a child how indifferent things were for us and the plight of history and everything else, and that certain people have an ideology of privilege and other people don't. I can't teach my child that. I teach my child straight away that you're born into privilege. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you having this beautiful melanin skin makes you uniquely special. You know what I mean? Makes you part of the essence of God. Yeah. Before anybody else. So my children know that. My two-year-old knows this. My two, my two-year-old walks around the house and said, "You know, Daddy, I'm God, you know, right?" So I can't because I think it's important to teach a child that Black Lives Matter as well. Because if I'm teaching Black Lives Matter to a young innocent white child, a young innocent white child whose parents happen not to be racist, you know what I mean? They're going to think, "Oh, we don't matter." So I get it when people say all lives matter. I get, it. I get, it. right? So Black Lives Matter as well, because if you look at things his historically, then we have been totally hard done by it. Um, economically, financially, spiritually, we've been disassociated with our spiritual beliefs and systems. So many things down the line. But for me personally, especially dealing with my children, it's like I'm teaching children that you matter, right? I don't need the cliche of the Black Lives Matter because we could get into it. Yeah, I get it. Yes, we do, man. 100%. But for me to jump on that and say like, oh, well, Black Lives Matter, I'm going to explain to you why we matter because no, 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 no. I'm not teaching my children from a point of disadvantage. I'm teaching my children from a point of privilege. Yeah, great answer. I love that. that fantastic. Kevin Campbell. Well, the, the, for me, the first thing is Black Lives Matter is a slogan. And I don't want the kid, my kid, if I'm explaining it to, to any kid, to just believe a slogan. There has to be some explanation into the history why there's the system of 
what they're born into and what they're coming, what they're going to come up against. They just happen to be black in this system because we know the system's crooked. We know the system works against us if you've got black skin or if, you've, if, if you're of a demographic that isn't white. We know that. So that's what I'll be hitting points so the individual, because always remember, if you're explaining it to a boy and you explain it to a girl, it might come out different because they're individuals. But the key is the logic of it. The logic of it is there will be hurdles because of your color. Whether I tell you you're the best thing since sliced bread, and then when you go outside, people are cussing you because of the color of your skin. Do you know what I mean? We've all had it. So it's, to, it's the realization of when you're in the house, this is the way you think. But I've got to prepare you when you go outside of this house. So you start to understand the intricacies of this life and the system that we live in. Because it's the system that is the fraud. Do you remember Matthew Baruga said the system is a fraud? It's true. It's the system that is the fraud. That has been defrauding people of color for years and years and years and years and years. So... All we want is a level playing field. That's all we want. But the level playing field has never been there. Exactly. So, Kevin, right, I'm going to stick with, I've got a specific question for Kevin and Spencer, and I've got questions for um, Paul and for Butch after, yeah? But mm-hmm. Kevin, going back to you, you played for Arsenal, you played for Arsenal from a youngster. So when you yeah. was coming up, right, playing football, Right, before before you signed, because I remember you was at Arsenal for when you was a young kid, then you signed yeah. the professional papers and you was at Arsenal for many, many years. Did you face any kind of racism as a professional football footballer growing up? And if you have, can you like, tell us, like, give us some instances of what you faced? Well, listen, growing up in Brixton, a, a young kid in Brixton, travelling all over the place, and don't forget, it's not like it's not like now where if you've got a kid in an academy, they get picked up and they get dropped. The parents take them there, and you know, listen, my family, we we never had no money for that. So I'm I'm traveling all over the place. I'm going. I'm traveling to Millwall. I'm traveling to uh, Chelsea. I'm traveling to Arsenal. I'm traveling to Charlton. You're traveling on London transport. You're going into areas where there ain't too many black faces. All of the above. You, you, you're walking past police, everything. And remember, back in the, back in the 70s, the sus law was right. Yeah. So I was getting stopped on a regular. You can imagine, I'm there in my school uniform, I've got my bag. Where's this kid going? You finish training, you come back. 12, 1 o'clock in the morning as a kid, 12-year-old kid, 11-year-old kid, got school the next morning and the police are stopping me on a regular, going through my stuff. But what can you do? For me, you've got to use it as a fuel, but not everybody's going to think that way. I had the mindset, I'm lucky, I had the mindset, I had good people around me who the street is always there. But you've got to be guided away from the street. Because if you want to do good in sport, the street, you cannot marry the two. So right. I was lucky. So, you know what I mean? There were, many, there were many people who got caught up in the street thing and their career couldn't take off. And, you know, it just, the street just brings more baggage exactly. for you. Exactly. It brings more baggage for you. But again... The individual has to use the logic again. You have to, because you have to think as an individual, I want to get out of Brixton because I know if I stay in Brixton, it, the system chews you up. Yeah. You know what I mean? The system does chew you up. I mean, there used to be all these sayings and slogans that used to, that hindered us. The man get rich and switch and all these kind of things. But that's all that's only used to hinder us, mm. really, because 
if you if you do well and you're from a certain part of London, <clears throat> they should be holding you in high esteem to say, look, he's from here. He's made it out. And when you do come back in, I'm lucky enough. I come back in, I bump into to, to my old friends and we're still friends. But there's many people who have done well for themselves, come back. They can't come back because man's looking to eat them. Yeah. This is the way... This is the way the system works. Yeah, yeah. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Exactly. This is the way the system works. The system has always been so difficult for black people inside the inner cities. Yeah. And it's, it, it's a tough one now <coughs> because left, right and centre, you're having to battle police. You're having to battle racism, not only from opposition coaches, not only from parents, not only from fans, but you're battling their own police in, and you're battling their own people in your own area. Yeah, for real. For wanting to do good. For real. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's always a tough one. Yeah, And there's real. many hurdles to get over. Thank you. Spencer, same thing to you. As a professional boxer, you battled through, you, like, you, you, you come from Brixton. I watch you, I watch you kind of grow up. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and go on to, to great things. So as a professional boxer in, in an industry that you chose have you experienced racism? And also, not just as a professional boxer, as a boxing promoter, because I know that you are probably one of the few black boxing promoters in this country. What have you faced? And what, is, what hurdles have you faced um, is, in, in terms of being people acting racist towards you or trying to hold you back because of your race? You, you know what it is? It's, this is like, in the UK, it's the racism, especially now, it's overt not over, it's not like America where it's in your face, in your face but it's there, but like on, on the reels, I can't racism ain't my problem and it's no, racism is none of the, the, the good gentlemen in this room right now, it's not our problem the racism is, is a racist problem <laughs> and what you what happened, this is what you realise is this go, go Google my name right now and put racism beside it and you see how much tons of things come up because you'll speak out about racism, you'll speak out, but I've noticed, or, or like you'll, you'll, you'll profoundly speak of a love that you have for your, for your blackness, then that's the problem. Yeah. You see what I'm trying to say? Yeah, that's, that is a problem. problem. As soon as you start speaking out of racism, then you're the racist. Or as soon as you start yeah. talking about you love your blackness, well if, you, well, if he loves his blackness so much, he must hate us. This is what I get. Yeah. All the time. So, but I mean, like, I'm. Tired, I'm tired of speaking about it, but because it's you, Frost, and you kind of raised me up around the ends from when I was a youth, you know what I mean? So, otherwise, I wouldn't be entertaining this conversation because I entertain this conversation with white people. I've been on, I've been on major platforms. Eight years I was at Sky, and it wasn't of interest when I started to burn the fire on Eddie Hearn and Frank Warren publicly. About remember, I remember. Frank about them not having no black stuff, but yet your two biggest commodities that Eddie Hearn was earning their money from was Dylan White and Anthony Joshua. When I started talking about that and saying, well, where's the representation on that side? When I was on, um, when Sky for Black History Month did uh, My Icon, and I went in and I blazed the fire, saying like, it's okay us being sports stars, it's fine, but where's the representation on the other side? Go well, look at football. Kevin can tell you. He knows. Kevin's my guy. Yeah. So I'm tired of speaking about this because the change or the implemented change is a solidarity. And we've been talking about this solidarity thing since 19, since when. So to me, it just becomes boring. What I'm trying to say is this, is that, of course, the racism exists. But, you know what I mean? What was it? Frank Sinatra said, the best form of revenge is massive success. Yeah. We just got to keep on playing forward. We just got to keep on pushing forward for the excellence. I don't want to say black excellence because as soon as we start saying that, white people feel left out, right? But I'm saying we as human beings, as individuals, we have got to push forward for excellence. And it starts with, with the teaching of morals and education. It starts, listen, welcome to Sunday school, bro. You know what I mean? That's nah, for reals. Welcome to Sunday school when you just get pick up on the Sunday. But them things you just teach your morals. So of course we're going to experience that form of 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 uh, of racism when as soon as you start doing things 
you're going to get a fight down. As soon as you start doing things or you start bringing in... Listen, I remember doing a show. Jack, uh, Jumping Jack will know because he played at my show and I sold out the Troxy. I was right? there. Yeah, I was DJing, yeah. Yeah, he was DJing. I sold it out and I thought he was going to give me a blind, not pay, and not and I have to pay. <laughs> but he like goes, by the sweat of your brother. <laughs> you know what I mean? And... And, I, and it's like, we go back a long time. I know Jumping Jack Frost when he used to have jerry curls. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Kevin knows me longer than that as well. All right, all right. Yeah, and I remember, like, doing that show. Jerry curls, yeah. And my, and my missus, and my missus came to the show. She came to the show with some of her work colleagues, right? So she came to the show with work colleagues. And I said, that was like my... Second show on Premier Sports. I've got a TV deal with Premier Sports at the time, right? And it was like, she's telling him to come to the show. Oh, yeah, yeah. So when, when the guys at our workplace wanted to meet me, she worked in HR. When the guys, white guys from our workplace, when they met me, it was like, it was like, oh, um, your boyfriend. Like, she said, yeah, no, it's my fiance. So I met the guys, shook their hands and that. And it's what, it's, it's your show. You get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. What? <laughs> What do you mean? Of course it's my that, that was a big show. That was a big boxing show. Yeah? It was a big show. It's a big so, show. So it's like, it's perceptions that certain people can have of you. Yeah. And they don't even understand just by the mere impertinence of saying to me, is that my show? Yeah. That's racist, brother. Yeah. Of course it is. Straight. Straight so, up. It, you know what I mean? It, Straight up. It is, it is what it is. And it's like, when you've got guys like Kevin, we have to salute that brother, you know. He's a soldier, you know, because, and similarly to myself, he didn't coon it to coin it. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. man out They do, they dumb down themselves. Listen, I'm, I'm breaking this down on rules. Right. When my contract went renewed with Sky, yeah, this is two years ago now, right? No big thing, because I'm, I'm at ESPN now, which is a far big thing. Miss Miss No, 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 it will, it will. When this George Floyd thing happened, one of the seniors at Sky, yeah, a senior, went to Johnny Nelson, who, Johnny Nelson's a black man, right? But he's a Yorkshireman, Yorkshireman before he's... Different, different kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, right? No disrespect. No, but he's my guy, so I don't miss Johnny, my guy. Anyway, so one of the seniors of the boxing team at Sky said, oh, you know what? With all this George Floyd thing going on right now, you know what? All that thing that Spencer was talking about, he was actually right. And you know what? I actually miss Spencer right now. Wait a minute, because I wish Spencer was here right now so we could talk about it. Oh, you're going to another black man, you know, and saying this to a black man. So you see the perceptions of where they hold certain black people and other black people. Yeah. So when I see, I know everyone on here ain't cooned into coin it. I know, or you wouldn't be on it. No, right? straight up. Straight up. So when I'm seeing men who have not left their cultural identity to climb up the ladder, right? That's all I'm saying. I love my culture. Yeah. I Listen, I've got, I got some friends in my business, some colleagues, yeah? All now, they haven't spoken out about nothing. All they want to do is don't upset nobody, yeah? But me, they just talk my thing, yeah? Right. Fuck Butcher. Butch, 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 Butch. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's working at the PRS. Have you noticed that a lot of black artists are not taking full advantage of the services available to them or are not, or are not aware of the services available to them or... Are, are certain services being hidden for black people? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I think it's, it's multi-layered because if you look generation, generationally and historically at black people's involvement in music, um, as, as Spencer was saying, we've, uh, we've, had a, we've been dealt a bad hand generationally over, over, the, over the course of the years. And what that's led to is... Um, a distrust of information sometimes coming from black spaces. And I guess, I guess this is me hypothesizing as well. Obviously I can't actually prove this, but what kind of tends to happen is that because of the whole crabs in the barrel mentality, it kind of, you, you, it's very hard to build a community spirit because in some instances, and it happens from quite a young age. I mean, it's, it's interesting because when you look at like young black boys in inner cities and, they're eventually they're going to get to a stage where they'll see another black man and they'll give him the black man head nod, isn't it? Mm. But automatically they're threatened. And, and that 
energy is sometimes very prevalent in the music industry whereby you should feel welcomed when you see someone in the building who looks like yourself that you can kind of liaise with and, and, and connect with and whatnot. And my DMs are open. I'm always talking to people as and when I can. But the, the, the perception that there's only space for this amount of Black people in that space. And if I let another person in, that, that diminishes my power in this area. I don't have that much clout. I don't have... So it's, it's a really kind of defeatist way of looking at the, the overall objective. And it, and it is sad because um, there's a lot of Black people that have compromised the overall objective, which is this is a generational push. Yeah. I know that if, I, if in my time here, I build my little brick and then the next generation build their brick, however many hundred years later, we've got a house. But because people aren't looking that way down the line, they're looking to just, they're, they're very insular. They're looking at themselves. What can I get out of this? Me, me, me. That, that energy, that mentality, if we don't begin to analyze it and break it down, then we're never going to push forward. Mm. Because if it wasn't for the space of the fact that I'm in the presence of, of, of my elders, and I said that I'm a very respectful person, whenever I meet pe- people that are older than me, I listen. There's one thing you can't cheat is experience. As much as people want to step in the room and they feel, oh, yeah, well, I know this one, I know that one. Sometimes, and that's, that comes with a lot of maturity and growth, you've got to put your ego aside, isn't it? And when there's a man there, whatever the field it is, they've got a life experience. As a black man, I'm there to learn, yeah? Because nine times out of ten, he's making life easier for me. He's walked through doors that I'm eventually going to walk through and he can give me the cheat code. The problem is, is that we are not, forming those alliances enough in the early stages of our career. We're kind of doing it at a point where we, we get burnt by the industry and then we turn back to that community for, for security and help. But realistically, that bit's a little bit too late because you've already identified that black community as a contingency. Yeah. That's not yeah. your home. That's, 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 for, that's what happens and, when, and when you hold, 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 hold that thought there a second. There's something I want to elaborate on. Mm-hmm. In the summer, you were very vocal about about a lot of stuff, and um, you you um, you done an issue for Mixmag called Blackout Mixmag. Can you explain what the concept was? Because I was really impressed by that. And can you just explain to everyone so so everyone can know exactly what you did? Because it was it was something that's never been, been done before. And I think you was a guest editor for one edition where the whole magazine was all blacked out, black artists, everything. Can you explain a little bit more about that, please? Yeah. So with with that. That kind of came about from, again, of having to, um, it's just like you, you, you strategize. You, you, you keep playing the same formation, 4-4-2, four, four, you're not getting the same results. You've got to switch it up, in it? So that's what that came about. I had to switch up the formation because the game is rigged. It's not, I was going up to labels. I was making records. I ran a label. I produced, I DJed, um, I mix, I, I teach. I, I've got so many skill sets, but yet the, the establishment was telling me I wasn't good enough to kind of, transcend into more influential positions. So sadly, when George Floyd died and Breonna Taylor passed in America, rather than people just kind of, oh, this is sad and eulogizing and all that kind of stuff, I was like, no, we, we need to learn a lesson because this man can't die on TV in front of everyone and it's just a moment in history. We have to make people understand that this is not going to happen again. And on a micro level, there's George Floyd's happening everywhere throughout the world and society. Because we're, we've got our necks being stepped on in the way we work. We can't be ourselves. We're always walking around in fear and, and placating and, 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 and so on and so forth. So that issue forced me into kind of explaining what are the kind of measures that have been put in place in the music industry to have two tiers, the exploiter and the exploited because that's the music industry that makes his money. Now, once you can begin to... The, the, the interesting thing about this here is that when you dig deeper into the music industry and you, and you try to find real hardcore data, statistics, to prove your point, what do you think? It's not there. So if I wanted to come across and be like, okay, cool, so you could have an argument and say, well, everyone listens to hip-hop and everyone listens to rap or everyone listens to dance or... Do you know what I mean? And it's like, okay, prove it. You can't find the statistical data 
to show how many members make that make that sound. And that's for a reason. That's for a reason. Because the moment you do that, yeah, you automatically shift power to a certain contingent where all of that energy is coming from, where all that talent is coming from. You can create all the, all the data around who's listening and all that kind of stuff. But the moment you begin to identify that this sound, this creation, this, this amazing product, which happens cycle after cycle, generation, we, we just make genres like that. It's just easy. We just create new things, dances. We create culture kind of thing. The moment you begin to do that, you empower a whole generation, right? That's when you have to call it black music. Yeah. And for the longest time, it wouldn't, it, black music, black was a dirty word. It couldn't be yeah. called black music. So I went through a process of kind of very forensically breaking down aspects of, well, house comes from there. Techno comes from there. Drum and bass. Well, it wasn't always called drum and bass. It was called jungle. What, what happened? Why did you change the word kind of thing? Why did, why were the creators of that sound, why did they not transcend into this new drum and bass if they were the ones who made it? And beginning to break that down into articles. And then you, you, the thing is, what I've, what I've noticed in my years of kind of navigating the space is that I want white people, whoever, in fact, to understand that when I talk, I don't talk for you. You don't talk for me. Kevin doesn't talk for me, Paul, because black people aren't monolithic. And what they've tried to do is that they try to kind of maybe put a black person into an organization as an appointment and say, yep, yeah, cool, we sorted all black people. Because what happens is that if you go up to someone, a, a white person in the street, and they'll watch a film, like let's say Made by an American, and where they're watching the film is, oh, the accent's terrible. They can't tell. They can't tell the difference between a Jamaican or a Bayesian or from, from Guyana or from, from Ghana or from, from Zimbabwe or something. It doesn't matter to them. They just see a black. So yeah, exactly. I, I always use this analogy. My analogy is this, um, and, and Kevin will probably understand as a broadcaster as well, that as, as a broadcaster, you have to be so on point when you're speaking to certain regions and nations within the country, yeah? And Farron as well, as a broadcaster, you know that if you, if you speak to Liverpool, you wouldn't say something as insensitive as saying, oh, how's everyone in Liverpool? Are you all reading the Sun newspaper? Because their relationship to that brand now, I've always said that white people don't have an awareness of the nuances of every aspect of blackness because they've never been forced to. But our careers depend upon it. We get that wrong, we lose our jobs. But there's no implications for getting it wrong if you're a white person, you move into a separate space. Like, white people go traveling, they might wear the wrong clothing in, in, in the Middle East, and they just call the embassy. Mm. You know what I mean? There's, there's always this get out of jail clause for them, but... Black people are really kind of, it's fear. I've always said that fear is a very good motivator because it keeps you on your toes and it keeps you, it keeps you conscious of offending people. Yeah. But white privilege, first and foremost, it, it doesn't really have any fear to it. There's no, there's no implications. They there's no consequences or nothing. No, I mean, I go on Instagram and I see them like hugging tigers. You know what I mean? And this, that's, <laughs> it's a joke, but... They're thrill seekers because that's been impacted into their life that they can live to the highest degree, no fear, whatever kind of thing. But, and, <laughs> but what I would love is, is there's a strong contingent now of white people who get it. They get the movement and they understand. Oh, yeah, 100%. Right. And that's, 100%. that's what's different. From 100%. 100%. Before, that, that largely, the, the contingent of white people that are more aligned with what we're going through, obviously they can never feel it completely, but they understand that, oh, okay, this is what we should be doing in our areas and pulling up people left, right and centre. So 19 features came out and it was basically looking at black women and how they've been um, literally erased because they're always drawn in to kind of, yeah, put your vocals in this, but the, the, the imagery, you won't be seen in the image, you won't be seen in the video, and then there's the colorism thing which comes into it. Educating the white establishment as to how colorism plays a part in it, how your approximation to whiteness equals success kind of thing. If you're too dark, then you're not going to make it as, a, as an artist in the, in the record industry. And really, really painstakingly breaking it down. And although I kind of went through stages where it was a, a, a case of should this reside on a black platform should we own it but the thing with me is that i'm always going to put 
the the message being communicated before the money. If 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 I have to I have to feel like did you receive this on your end before I even think about the money? Because oh yeah, cool. I could have put all those ninety features out on my platform and could have made some money out of it. But then what? Yeah. I'll put it on Mixmag because Mixmag is the biggest electronic music publication and it'll go to all four corners of the world. Definitely. Job, job 100%. done. 100%. Job there, done. <laughs> Thank you. Paul McKenzie. Paul McKenzie. Um, hey. I've got a special question for you. Question. I was absolutely <laughs> dumbfounded. I watched a video of you walking to Scotland Yard and give a talk to a room full of policemen. Yeah? But you done something very ingenious before you started your talk. You made a joke. That broke the ice. Let me, let, let me tell you what the ice broke. And you know what? I, 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 I really want to know what that was because as soon as you broke the ice, you had the room. Can you could tell us what that was? Because that was ingenious. Very, very good point to pick up there. Well, okay. So this was the Metropolitan Police AGM. Uh, and my section was in the serious youth violence section, uh, all about how we can get young people to kind of follow the guidelines and stop doing what they're doing. So, you know, being the only black person in the room and obviously being from a semi stand up comedy pro, uh, career, 10 years, I said, uh, you know, and what you said earlier about when you walk into a room and the black person automatically feels like something's wrong. And so I, was, I sat there with my wife and she was saying, how are you feeling about going on stage? And you was wearing your baseball cap and everything. Yeah, I said, you know, and shorts as well, you know. And I said, I was like, and this is, the, this is the, the Metropolitan Police AGM. And I said, if I'm going there, I'm going there as me. And I want to be yeah. as comfortable as possible. And so when they called my name, and up until that point, everybody was sleeping with the speakers. And it was relatively boring. And I stepped on stage and I said, okay, what can I say? Because I have to think about what's in their mind. You know, you've got this six foot five black guy standing on stage at an AGM. Um, kind of disrespecting the dress code in, in some way, what can I say? So the first thing that came to my mind is that I feel like a raisin in a bowl of rice pudding. And I tell you what, and I tell you what. That's what it was. Right? <laughs> Listen, and I tell you what, I paused for a moment there, and then I even said to them, it's okay to laugh. And when they laughed, right, and I'm telling you, after, after, the, after the seminar, after the conference, every one of them came up to me and they said, that is, the, that is the best intro anybody's ever done at one of these AGMs. Because what we do at these AGMs is we don't address the elephant in the room. You know, so I've seen, I've, I've been with, uh, I've been to seminars with St. Giles. I've been with all kind of knife crime organizations. And what I found is always the black representative is the one that's doing all the sucking up, all the sucking up. He's the one that comes into the room, grassroots, and then transforms into some kind of a, uh, I don't know, can I, can I say the word coconut? Of course you can. In the, all right, I say the word coconut because it's such an old phrase, but that's I say it all the time. It's something I never do. So when I go to an event, whatever event it is, I go how I feel comfortable. I go how I go out on the streets and, and meet young people. And this is me. And I think that's a lot of the, the issues uh, around this whole black thing. Just going back to that Black Lives Matter, because uh, around that time, I remember I, I made a video and the video was basically addressing the fact that, yeah, we know Black Lives Matter, but where were the black people in those communities when we had serious youth violence and we had like the highest murder rate on the street in years? Those same people were not out rallying. Those same people were not, you know, putting up protests. And so the video was all about addressing that. And it, again, it's the elephant in the room. It's about talking about what we, and that's what I do on my podcast, is talk about the things that we feel uncomfortable about talking about. You know, sweeping, because we, you know, as a community, you have with this big rug and then we just sweep everything under this rug. Uh, I'm talking about from disability right the way down to child sexual uh, exploitation. All of these things we sweep under the rug. Grooming, we sweep under the rug. I, I, you know, I addressed grooming a couple of years ago. I would walk through my community and have black people say to me, yeah, I work for the policeman then. And I said, well, well, no, I'm not working for the policeman then. But that person that lives next door to you hasn't seen their child for three months. I'm working for that family. 
And so it's all about, and I get it, I get this whole thing about, you know, we have to be, you know, when we walk in the room, we have to represent and and kind of touching on that whole music thing as well. It's it's like for for me, sometimes I find it difficult to deal with that. And 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 I'm going back to what the knowledge said there. It's almost like you talk about it so much that you get to a point where you don't want to address it anymore. You just want to, you just want to move on. You just want to be the person that you want to be. So going back to that whole conference and why I said that, yeah. because by the time I got to the stage, I didn't see that was any difference. And I, I had to make it clear that if you see a difference, let's clear this up right now. And after that, it was like literally every ear in the room was open. So literally, that's what I do now. So if I, I, thought, I, was, I thought it was ingenious. I thought it was ingenious. So that's what I do now. I, I don't, I don't feel challenged by white people. I don't feel challenged by being the only black man in the room. In fact, I've learned now and I've reframed it all that when I walk in a room, I want them to look at me. I want them to see how powerful I am. You, you understand? I was at a Tavistock <clears throat> seminar. And they threw out this question that they said that um, what's the number one cause of mental health in the black community? And the room was full of black people <clears throat> and nobody knew. Everyone was like drugs, uh, music, uh, slavery. The number one cause of mental health in the black mental health challenges in the black community is the knowledge that you have to present yourself as black everywhere you go. So every room you walk into, you're aware that you're the black guy. Every shop you walk into, you're aware that they're watching you because you're the black guy. And so I just chose, you know what? Now that I know this, I'm going to play against the grain. So when I walk into a shop and pick up an expensive bag uh, and try and steal it, no, I would never do that. That would be funny, though, wouldn't it, if I just try and steal it? Um, I, I pick it up like I own this bag. I don't pick it up like, oh, my, they're going to watch me now. No, and if I have to confront them about it, that's when that's when I start twisting it on them to show them that, listen, I don't know why you're watching me. I should be watching you because you're the thief. Yeah? So so in so when I do these things and you know, I love talking about I love talking to young people about this whole thing about racism and what we have to understand is that young people have a completely different view of it. They have a completely different view of what a friendship is, what a relationship is. And uh, what they do understand a lot of is about the language in music and how that language in music uh, has these presuppositions that, hold on a minute, black people hate black people. And so, you know, when you spoke about that from, from a music point of view, that's an interesting conversation. Yeah. Why, why is it that the music that sells always perpetuates black on black violence or, or the fact that, you know, I'm broke and I live in I live in a council estate. But if I rent a Lamborghini for the day and drive it into that state and then make, make a music video, I'm getting 10, 20 million hits. And none of those comments are saying this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Yeah, but it sells. And so that's that's kind of where I'm going with this whole thing now. So I'm dropping the whole mantra about, you know, them and us, them and us, because since I changed my mindset, I have not had an issue. Yeah. I have to say, I've not had an issue. I've been in so many rooms and I've put aside that whole thing that was driving me mad for years about, you know, I'm a, I'm a black guy. Yeah. I'm a black guy. And I just want to tell you this one story that made me realize that racism uh, or the perception of racism lies within every white person. Whether they believe it or not, it's ingrained there somewhere. I used to work at... Um, a law firm called Clifford Chance, one of the biggest in Europe. And I remember I had this really great relationship with um, a PA, white woman, yeah? Really great relationship. We talk about the weekend, we go lunch, everything like that. And I remember feeling completely comfortable until one day when she went to the toilet and she came rushing back out to grab her bag. And I remember sitting there thinking, here we go again. <laughs> Here we go again. And it was like, and I'll tell you what, right? I never lasted in that workplace three months after that I was gone because I just couldn't get my mind over why, why you rushed out, looked at me, saw that I was in the same position, but took your bag. 
Why and and to this day, I'm still like, why would she have? Here we go again. Here we go again. So so for me to focus everything on why she did that, rather than sort of saying, well, you did that because you're ignorant. Yeah. You 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 know your your lack of knowledge made you do that. Yeah. That's where my focus is now. Is you know if it's your lack of knowledge, then it's it's your lack of knowledge. But right now, I'm carving away, uh, and if you get in the way, I will chop you down. And I'm going to say this. I would chop you down whatever color you are because I face some of the biggest oppositions. Listen, Frost, you know what I do, innit? I know. I, I work with you sometimes. You know what I do? I go into yeah. my community and I just, when I go into my community, who do you think the biggest opposition is from? Our own people. <laughs> Say no more. And I'm, I'm talking about over the last five years, biggest yep. opposition. If, yep. I put, 100%. If, if I create something to raise awareness, for our own people, mm. and I post it on my platform, who do you think shares it? White people. <laughs> I'm telling you that right now. You Thank go. you for that, man. No problem. Right, so we're going to move on to this question, right? Um, it is, is it, right, I'm going to, I'm going to start off with Spencer on this one. Is it right that demographic information is taken when we apply for jobs? Yes, it is right. And I'm going to be real. Go on. Because sometimes we just got to watch white people. <laughs> I'm just being real. <laughs> what, you think, they say like demographic information, it's like, you know what? I've covered this so many times. It's like the right person for the job should get the job. Yeah. But, you know how it goes. You know what I mean? It's just, you know how it goes. So, Sometimes it's like, we like, you know what? Lots of the things, let me just tell you this, like, I want my life and all the rest of it. Lots of the things that we get is for a bringing, you know? It's yeah. for a man, you know, you know, a man, and da, 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 da. it's for a bringing, right? Now, we as human beings, we base ourselves more, more uh, on, our, on our similarities, but the thing that we hold deep is like, um, is our differences. So when we're doing these kind of things, it's like, you go think, you think about this, right? When I was at Sky, me getting into Sky was a brigand. Yeah. I'm going to be 100 with it. It was a brigand. Right? It just happened to become the number one boxing podcast in the world when I was yeah. on it. Yeah. It's now dead that I'm not on it. Dead. It's dead. No, no, watch it no more. It's dead. dead. <laughs> right? And I'm looking, I'm saying, you bitches. Right? But <laughs> I'm keeping it 100. I'm keeping it 100. I'm, I just got to be that way. Right? But... It is, you understand what I'm trying to say? It, it is It is what it is. And I can't say, no, they shouldn't have this down because you never know. Well, you know, it's like we base ourselves, it's like, what team you support? Like, Punk Butcher, what team? You? You're Arsenal, man, yeah? So therefore, you would have... I should not. <laughs> bad boy, Mr. Campbell now, because when he was at Arsenal and he was tearing it up, you have an affinity there. You know what I'm trying to say to you? You're not having an affinity because my affinity would be more with you because you're bearded, I'm bearded. You know what I mean? Um, Jack, Jack Frost, the one you bought the products that you used to put in a year and all, right? So, <laughs> things, things. So we base ourselves on, on, on what we can see as, as, as our, our similarities, but we also base our things on our, on our differences. But we should hold more embedded to our similarities. Now, from the time someone writes a name, most of us have got um, through colonial slavery, we have European names. So if no one knew anything about boxing and I wrote on a thing, Spencer Theron, straight away you're going to think I'm a white man, you know? Yeah, straight. Right, straight away. You're going to think he's a white man. You know what I mean? So obviously they want to delve a little bit more deeper into certain things. And I think on certain times, just like my brother was saying, they think like if they hire a black person, then that's all our black issues sort taken care of, right? But the majority of the time when they hire a black man, the black man is the kind of guy that they went to university with. Yeah, token black guy. Like, let's get right. a token black guy in there. He's a kind of you know what I'm trying to say. I know He's exactly what you mean, man. That, that doesn't really wear his cultural identity on his sleeve. Yeah, right? we will know those guys. Right, right. <laughs> 
they feel, they, you know what I said, they, they'll feel safe yeah. bringing yeah. them into the game. You get what I'm trying to say? They'll, exactly, they'll exactly, exactly. So, like I said, most of the stuff, I've never in my whole life written out a job application in my whole life. I don't even know, I wouldn't even know how to start. I, I haven't even got a CV. I just say, I just, I'm, I'm just so grateful that I've been in the position that I've had to, 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 to be able to network and to know my goals and aspirations and go after them. That's not going to be like that for everybody. You understand? But it's a network. So it's like, it is what it is. Because, for instance, now, I'm, I'm saying, okay, then we've just started. Like, MTK Global Football just started. You must have seen it. Big yeah. game, right? Yeah. I work for the foundation. I'm also a scout for the boxes, right? I know Kevin. So I'm saying, all right, Kev. There's a little opportunity here, blah, blah, blah. And Kev said, I don't need it. Um, I've got a cousin. All right, send your cousin in. He sends his cousin in. They write up the application. They send it in to the company. Goes into the company. They're looking at it now. And they're seeing Owen Campbell. And I said, bro, Owen Campbell, that's Kevin. So on certain things, it's a bring-in. It, yeah. It's the same. It's the same what Europeans do, white folks do all the time. Why don't we do that? Yeah. Because when you're looking at certain guys who reach up certain status, in, in, in certain industries. I was saying, right, how'd you reach to, to this point? Oh, well, what it was, my uncle used to go to university with, with the guy that was running the da 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 and so, this, so why don't we do that? Yeah, exactly, exactly. But in fact, matter of fact, we're doing it right now because yeah, there's we, powerhouse. Here you go, bro. Here you go. So, Butch, same thing. Is it right that demographic information is taken when we apply for jobs? What's your take on this? A million percent, because that's how you measure whether or not they're doing their job because if there's no, if there's no marker from where from point A to point B, then because they're not collect, like I said with the music thing, the the certain data on who the the artists are and so on and so forth, then they can continue with the nepotism and this whole thing of system, systemic racism and institutional racism it exists in our heads, so to speak, because they didn't measure what. The, the number of black employees was at point A and then where it shifted from. So the thing I'm more invested in is the language. The most infuriating thing I've seen over the, um, like the past couple of years is that, that term BAME. And it just... I'm going to come, just, I'm going to, come to that in a minute. <laughs> don't worry, so, don't, we're going to get into that in a minute. Carry okay, on. Okay, cool. We're going to get into that real yeah. soon. Real soon. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. But it's that homogenization of people of color. And, doing, and it's even when you look at that. So it's the language. And language is very important because language, it mobilizes you and it can, and it can de-incentivize you also when you hear language used in a certain terms. So when, if there is a people of color and then, there's, then you can identify a race which doesn't exist within that people of colour, you begin to question, hold on, how can there be categories within the, the, the wider contingent of human race kind of thing? How could it be broken down where one race exists outside of it, even though, and this is, even though, and this is the thing, this is the most like um, um, interesting part of it, is that... Um, one billion people, right, are from China. One billion people are from India, okay? By definition, they are the most powerful people because they, they, there's more of them en masse. But the way history has contextualized things that the power resides in this contingent because, and that has permeated through history and, and whatnot, and it, and it does. It has a very, very negative and destabilizing effects on people and their confidence as they move through the industry. Now, the one thing I've begun to understand, and, and it's probably my strongest suit, is I, I don't have that imposter syndrome. I walk into rooms, I walk into areas, and I don't business because I'm there in it kind of thing. I'm not the biggest guy. I don't need to be the biggest guy. The thing is, the, because my brain thinks as sharp as anyone, but you can begin to foster an imposter syndrome when you attach certain capabilities to races and stereotypes that, oh, yeah, you're supposed to do this or you can't do that, that or like um, what um, uh, Spencer was alluding to when 
the woman was shocked that, oh, this is your show. Like, he can't, he, all of that stuff. So it, it, all the language, that has to get broken down. But when you start collecting the data, and then it has, it has to be twofold. Once we get those opportunities, right, we need to make use of them. So once we're in the building, that's when we can throw, throw down the, the, the life rope and begin to reel in more people it, through, through, because other industries, other communities are doing that. They're creating that lineage through, across generations, across different parts of the community to be, oh, well, and they're signposting as well. So, oh, okay, well, I can't provide you this opportunity, but it doesn't stop there. You send that person to someone else who may be able to help them. But, I mean, that's... That has to start from collecting the data and identifying that there's a problem to begin with. And for the largest part, the data hasn't been collected. And that in itself is quite suspicious. Yeah, 100%. Great stuff. So, Kevin, same question to you, brother. Is it right that the demographic information is taken when we apply for jobs? What's your take? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I don't see that as being the, the big problem. I'll I tell you what is the big problem on, on these forms. The fact of the matter is that you see white at the top. The first box that you tick is white. Then underneath that, there's black African. Then it's everything is broken down beneath that. Why? Is, 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 is there not different sets of white people? Do you understand what I mean? And it goes in alphabetical order normally, but how is white at the top? Mm -hmm. So the very nature of these forms are dubious. Yeah. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? So, again, this is all part of the system. And the system is pieced together, link by link by link, to unhinge people of color. It's yeah. that simple. Yeah. Whichever way you look at it, we go left, there's a block. We go yeah. right, there's a block. We go forward, but throwing down the ropes and helping our own people move up, everybody does it. That's for sure. And you know what? Why not put the names down? Why not put all the information in? Because at the end of the day, if we don't do it, we're going to come unstuck somewhere down the line. Somewhere else, you know what I mean? Somewhere else they're going to use that against us. Yep. Against us. Exactly. To catch exactly. up. Exactly. Same question to you, Paul McKenzie. Absolutely. We live in an information age, right? Uh, information about what we even eat now, where we, ev everything is information now. And so I, I, ca I can't see the problem with it. You know, I can see where it's of value because all data is of value. Uh, I just think that there's so much other things. I mean, look at what's happening now in the climate that we're in now. Look at the amount of information that's been taken to potentially use against us um, in the future. And I don't really want to go down that whole road about COVID and, and what I believe is going to go on. But it's information. Yeah. You know, I, I can't, I can't see, I can't see anything wrong with the use of information if it's done um, for, in a positive way. If the, if the, it, you know, if it's done for a positive. Uh, outcome. I can't see the problem with it. Okay, great stuff. So we're going to go back, right? Back. I know someone we spoke about, BAME. I personally, I'm just not in it, this whole BAME thing. But the question is, and I want everyone to, everyone to answer this, I'm going to start with you, Paul, all right? Yeah. Is the term BAME correct and respectful? For example, it doesn't seem to cover gypsies or the travelling community who are, who are classed as white but are very much a minority. Again, it's one of those things. I've, you know, I'm doing a, a few workshops at the moment, Zoom workshops, and in the title, it's it's about you know these workshops are specifically for BAME, and, and you know, and they're all about collecting data and statistics about how they feel during COVID, but specifically for BAME. And I keep looking at this and thinking, I hate it. Yeah, there's something wrong here. It, it's like, um, why do we need that? You know, why why do we need that? Now in this time, why, why do we, why, why everything that is potentially to collect data or to support or help black people now this, this whole thing with the BAME. So me, I don't agree with it. I think it's something that they can scrap. Yeah. hundred percent. I hate it. I can't stand it. Yeah. Same question to Spencer. It doesn't. 
And and I'm I'm with boxing, I'm really grateful. I've grown up with gypsies. And and using the terminology gypsy is actually an offensive word. It's travelers, they're travelers. You know what I mean, so I'm just right. But seeing as it's been brought up, I'm just touching it because to somebody who is a traveler, they don't mind calling themselves gypsy, but it is an offensive terminology, right? Okay. Right. But I'm saying it doesn't cover them. And you have to understand that gypsies, I've grown up with them through the boxing from amateur days, from when the gypsies would come like near Mostyn Garden and park up right next to my old school. And your gypsies ain't scared of no one. The traveling community, not scared of no one. Mm. Right? They have a, 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 a sense of entitlement, how they 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 roll. And they they are, they are excluded. It was like Tyson Fury came out with something. He said, like, certain um people from the traveling community got racially abused by not allowed to go into a restaurant and the person went and it was filmed. So Tyson Fury started uh what was it? Um Travelers Lives Matter, and he went his campaign, right? In a bit tongue in cheek, because I'm saying you look back, yo. Last week you were saying all lies matter, you and your wife, and now, yeah. all right. And I ain't gonna gun him too. I'll correct the same company. Where MT, what? My guys for a long time. But I'm saying, hold up a second. You're right. And of course, we know we're black folks, so we know there's a synergy between blacks and Irish. Yeah, hundred percent. Six from 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 um, the nineties. From, from what you got? Exactly. Race act that came into play in our country. But we also know, like, there's that synergy, and there's also a synergy between the travelers. Reason why there's a synergy between the travelers because they're ostracized people. Yeah. Period. So you, I'd get down with them because most of the guys, well, the white guys were actually travelers. They were the guys that they were the guys we used to we used to muck around with. We used to do things with. So it is it doesn't include travelers, but yet we know. And I remember there's a guy called um, um, John Frankham, ex fighter When Tyson Fury was getting ready to fight Klitschko, and Mini was talking, he sat me down. He probably educated me. So I'm like, you say, Spence, I could take you to certain parts now, and you as a black man could walk into these shops with no problem, and they know I'm a traveler, and they're not allowing me to go inside the shop. I said, you're joking. Tyson, this is six years ago, Tyson Fury fought Klitschko. This man's telling me this. This man, so he broke down the whole thing. Even though I knew about it, remember the travelers are ostracized. But this Bain thing, while I was at Sky, I was begged by some of the seniors. Oh, Spence, we're having a Bain committee meeting. Could you go? So they want you to go to make up numbers, and they know I'm vocal. So I, right, ch- ch- I go to this foolishness. Gone to it, brother. It was the most embarrassing thing that I've ever gone to in my life. It was just, and it made it worse. It was a black woman, right, that headed it. That had to come in, and she was there talking, and it was very patronizing. It was, it was, it was kind of disrespectful to the street because she was speaking to people who were black and Asian and ethnic minority, right? So when she's speaking to us, I'm saying, brother, yeah, this you're taking liberties, you know. And she laughed. She said, "No, but this is the role that you've got." She's written to companies like Sky to get through the door and it's taken her to get a reply. It was like six months. And then when she got in there now, it was like, it's a joke thing. But now, everybody are running on this Black Lives Matter thing, no, it? Everyone's running on, oh, oh, we've got we've to be seen like we're doing something. Yeah, everyone, everyone wants, let's get a black face. Let's do the, let's do the token, this token. Right, right, right. right. Well, go ahead. Right. But, but the tokenism that they're bringing is like, when the black man them go into them situations, they know they don't need to rock the boat. They're like, right, you know what? Because it's very calculated that these things are going. You know what? Sometimes I see Kevin, like Kevin's down in the studio. I'm upstairs doing my show. I run downstairs to go meet Kevin. I say, what? They might not like that. They don't like that synergy. That we, they don't, do you think they like that? They don't like that, brother. They want it. They want us to be like them, yeah. not network. Being a certain, they don't want how we are. They're frightened of how we are. Yeah. They're frightened of uh, our communication. They're frightened of, like, our, and they know, the smart ones know. The smart ones know that our communication as a black man, even out to the nod of the head, too, 
even down to the vowels that we use, because when we're taking the slaves, a lot of us weren't speaking the same language. So, uh, they want to, oh, oh, yeah, they know this thing. They think they don't know. <laughs> and they the know the thing, man. Bro, they feel threatened by it, brother. So, but in order to, to, to kind of dumb it down, let's have this Bane thing. <laughs> Look at the excellent work we're doing right now. They have no affiliation to us. They don't want to have no affiliation. There's certain ones that have affiliation to us. And they're the ones who are seen as the rubble rousing white ones as well, or the, or what they call it, the wigger ones and all the rest of it and blah. But it is what it is. But what I, what I have to say is this. We, as who we are as black people, we just got to keep on pushing it. Yeah. As simple as right? Nothing more, nothing less. Just keep on pushing where it starts is in the household. So, Bun Bame, Bame is a bag of foolishness. I'm telling you that now. I've been on it. It is embarrassing. But you know what? I'm looking at it, and it was a black woman that organized it. And I had to say, you know what? It's a bag of shit. But you know what? I have to high five you because you're cutting a check from these people. Yeah, 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 yeah. Straight up. Now, you know, <laughs> straight up, B. You know what I mean? Yeah, straight, straight, straight up. up. That's fun. So, Butch, what's your take on this? Is the term BAME correct and respectful? For example, it doesn't seem to cover the gypsy or traveler communities who are classified as white but are very much a minority. What's your take on this? I think, again, it's, it's all about education. I think doing what I'm doing, I've been lucky to travel a lot with the music and the DJing over the years when I was on, um, from when I was on Deja, Rinse, Kiss FM, and I can travel up and down the country. And I would begin to identify how parts of the United Kingdom were talking about England or talking about London. And in my head, I think, like, okay, well, you're acting like you're, you don't come from this country, but you can't talk to someone who's Welsh and I didn't reference them as someone who is English. You can't do that. Or someone who's Scottish or someone who's Northern Irish. And you begin to, we, as sometimes as black people, we kind of make that faux pas of homogenizing white people thinking that, okay, you're, you're all queen and country, so to speak. And, and, and I think that falls into that, that idea of, it, obviously it gets very difficult to kind of break people down into micro levels and, and whatnot. And the labeling can become a bit, a bit exhausting. But when you look at the, the BAME acronym, yeah, it just doesn't even make sense because the first, the first letter is a race. Then the second letter is a continent. Yeah. Right. And then it's just, Minority ethnic, yet China and India make up the majority of the world's population. So of the 8 billion people in the world, 2 billion of them come from two countries. But they want to say that they're the minority. Minority where? You can't go to China and call them a minority. They'll laugh at you. He said, are you all right? But, <laughs> but this, is, this is the kind of language, which again, language is very important because when it gets repeated over in different spaces, you begin to believe it. You begin, oh, this is it. This must be the superpower. Like USA, UK, they're the superpowers, but they haven't been for God knows how long because every time China flinch or Russia flinch, it's like it's world news. Mm. So we can't be that power. We can't be that powerful anymore at the West. So there's a lot of elephants in the room from a political standpoint that, that don't want to be addressed because it's quite humbling. Uh, so that BAME acronym, it needs to get done away with because even when you look at from a Brexit position now, this country is moving into new territories. It was, it was yeah, top three, but now we're, 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 we're fighting for relegation. Yeah, 100%. Brexit has really, really put us in a space where from time you're having to knock on people's door and be like, oh, do you want to trade with us? Do you want to trade with us? Mm. Because all those relationships have gone down the pan. It's it's that it's that level of of power that the this country used to enjoy, and it has to. And it's from that space, that uncomfortable space that the country is in, that it can begin to rebuild. It can never rebuild from a space where the, the ego is present. It's the superpower. It's enjoying the wealth. What it's privilege? The relationships. Yeah, it has to. It has to rebuild socially from a really weakened state from when everyone else can point at them and say, yeah, you've been treating us bad here and there and this one and that one. And then it can begin to educate and implement these places. So that is the uncomfortable conversation, which isn't 
just here. It's it's in the the the, the kind of in Westminster and throughout this country as a whole. Because for the most part, you've got to look at it like this: the way the UK has kind of operated in a space where we would be we would be funding wars in different parts of the world, but we just carried on. And then it's what's interesting. The reason why I love Twitter is because when we went through what we went through with the riots and COVID, if you logged into certain aspects of Twitter, they're just like, oh, 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 okay, it's your turn now. Because this has been normal life for us. This, this, this disruption and chaos, we've been experiencing for like 30 years, 40 years. You're, you, what, you've had lockdown for what? Little piece of 18 months and you're crying. We've had bombs on us for God knows how many years. So it's that humbling experience that you begin to kind of recontextualize sometimes how lucky you are, but that has to come from like a, a, a real shocking experience. This is our trauma. This is that point where someone swerved, we've just missed a tree and we're just like, oh my gosh. Like we yeah. saw the light flash before our eyes and then we get, oh, this is how lucky we are. And we, begin, we can begin to build from having these very tough conversations as to, oh no, why did we call those people BAME, yeah. but really not incentivize them and empower them? Where is the real power behind the appointments with people from the Black, the Asian communities, the traveling communities, if we're kind of, and it's difficult because sometimes I see, I see positions being built for Black people into companies, but it's, it's, it's almost like they're mothballing them because they're not really in the, the meat and potatoes of the company. They're like, oh, well, I'll make you a diversity and inclusion officer. No offense to anyone who's got that role, but a diversity and inclusion officer, right? Are you, are you in the real meetings day to day? Can you stand up? Are you getting the minutes? No, you get brought in to assess the makeup of the, of the company and if it's balanced, if it's fair, to again tick a box. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't know, you probably, you probably get some tax breaks from the, the, the treasurer for having this quote and that quote and that quote. It, and, and the thing is, it's, it's all, there's, there's, a, there's a science to the way the politics is running this country. But like, like Kevin said, it's a system. And real intelligence comes from understanding systems. It's not about how many A's you got. Or like, I know there's some man in the ends, they're intelligent because they understand the system of their environment. It doesn't matter if you bring a boy from Oxford or Cambridge, you won't survive there. And similarly, you have to be intelligent and understand the environments you work in. That system is, is, is rigged. It's always going to be, I guess, a, an 80-20 split. The 20 is in our favour. It's not really built to kind of have us up at a 50-50 right. level pegging because then you, you have to look eye to eye with a man. So that's why yeah. when I, I, I remember this... Um, um, this, this, this interesting quote that if you can't respect me as an ally, you have to become my enemy. Yeah. Because at that point, I'm level pegging with you. Yeah. yeah. If you won't respect me as like I'm, I'm your friend or your power, or whatever, I have to become your adversary. And then it's just, you know what I mean? Right. You, know, you know about He Man and Skeletor. You don't know about He Man's best friend. <laughs> no, no one knows about He Man's brethren. They just know about He Man and Skeletor. Yeah, that's it. Like, that's it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> So listen, we, we are we, we're almost out of time. Kevin, same question to you. I, I'm going to ask Kevin this, and I'm going to ask everyone one a, a, a question. I, I just want a one one word answer. No, like elaborating on it. So, Kevin, Ross, look, I'm going to be quick on this because quick, listen, quick. Uh, the, the, the the guys are being good. Who come up with this this thing? Who come up with Bane? Right? The people that, in, that's what we got. No, the that's what we got to look at. Yeah. Who come up with this thing? Who why should we identify? Listen, our parents came here and we went through trials and tribulations to be ourselves, not to be put, have a tag put on us and everybody cobbled together. Yeah. No chance. Yeah. I don't I don't identify to it. I don't relate to it. And nobody else should. So okay. that's all I want to say about it because I don't I feel the same. I, I don't reference to it. I don't want it anywhere near me. Same thing. Right. So listen, right? We're out of time. I'm gonna ask everyone one question. Yes or no, right? Starting with you, Kevin, ex-professional <laughs> footballer, taking the knee on a football pitch, yes or no? Yes. Spencer, taking the knee on the football pitch, yes or no? Yes. 
Paul, taking the knee on the football pitch, yes or no? Yes. Butch, taking the knee on the football pitch, yes or no? Yes. Right, thank you guys. This is the Frost Report. Thank you for coming along. Due to restrictions, we've had to do it like this. And I'd like to get everyone back around the table um, at some point. Thank you all for taking part. You've blessed me. God bless you all. Thank you. I get high, I get high, I get high of your memories